almost perfect. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this academic lecture of the Phenolab. It's a great pleasure of mine to ask Dr. Eric Zvita Olsen uh, from um, the Husserl Archive in Köln. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Eric and his important work on dementia. Uh, Eric pursued his studies in philosophy, psychology, and theology at the Christian Halbrecht University to Kiel from 2007 to 2012. He went on to complete his PhD at the Julius Maximilian Universität zu Würzburg from 2013 to 2018 and published his work, his PhD thesis entitled Horizons of the Life the World, published by Fink Verlag. Subsequent to a SOCAM fellowship at the German Literature Archive in Marbach, he has been working as a research assistant alongside Timo Breya since 2016. Initially, he was associated with the research lab of the Artist Graduate School of the Humanities Cologne. And since 2022, he has been affiliated with the Husserl Archive at the University of Cologne. Huh. Yeah, I think Francesca has some connection issues. Um, but, but may I interrupt? Um, feel free to put your cameras on. Right now I'm just seeing Dennis. Um, and it would be really, really nice, especially for the discussion, to, to see you. Yeah. Very you nice. Thank you. Yes, I don't know what is happening. So, so somehow. The meeting is getting me off, it's kicking me off. So Eric was also a research fellow at the Center for Subjectivity Research in Copenhagen. And uh, he is working on a, um, a national working group on trans transdisciplinary dimension and aging research. Today, Eric will present a very interesting talk on dementia uh, with a very provocative title, Phenomenology of Dementia. So thank you very much for accepting my invitation, Eric, and the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Francesca, for that great invitation and introduction. For me, it's it's really a pleasure to speak in the context of the Fino Lab. Um, hi. I think it's it's one of the outstanding institutions. Um, even if it's online, it's um, um, it's really um, unique, I guess, because it reflects on the intertwinement between philosophy and medicine in general and psychiatry and phenomenology in particular. And for me, it's, it's a perfect environment for, for giving a talk. And so I try to share my presentation. Give me one second, please. Does it look good? Or does it work? <laughs> yes, it works. So perfect. Um, Francesca, I think you meant the subtitle, Still a Forgotten Task, um, and this is a more some kind of programmatic talk, um, giving a broader orientation over the work I have did, but uh, a small excuse, I was either myself sick in bed or caring for my daughter and my wife in the last two and a half weeks. It's not nothing uh, severe, but nonetheless, I, I couldn't work philosophically. So um, be, be kind with me, especially in the discussion. So without further ado, I would like to start. Um, yeah, to, to give you a, a short orientation on the objectives, premises, and the background I'm bringing with to you. Um, first of all, I would generally give an overview over the work of my last few years. And some notions will be um, embodied habits, existential homelessness, and the Sinter potential. Uh, you will see what I mean with that, but I just picked a few. You will see there are several others uh, could be chosen too. Um, I would like then to reflect obstacles and give perspectives of dementia research under the notions of naturalism, nemocentrism, and embodyism. I don't know if that word exists, but now it, it does exist. 
um, and to promote, uh, and really in, in that sense of promotion, um, a phenological psychopathology of dementia, because I'm working on that over the last five years in several papers and publications, and I'm not really sketching that today, but I want to promote that to, to, to make, make a bit advertisement here um, for, for that kind of specific um, way to, to do dementia research. And um, the notion of the life world, again, I, I won't dig deep into that today, it will be the terminus a quo and the terminus a quem. quem. So it's the starting point of the investigation and it's the goal of the investigation with that paradigm I'm using. The premises are, um, um, one could say, um, on three functions of phenological psychopathology in dementia research. There is a balancing function, one could phrase it like that, um, to add the natural counterpart um, on, on the um, dominant research paradigm. So instead of de uh, deficits, we talk about resources. Instead about cognition, we talk about embodiment and so forth. Um, there is a founding function. Um, we, we should embrace and we can embrace with our method um, the life world experience beyond brains, classifications, and also discourses. That will be something I will reflect in the end of the paper. And the bridging function um, between obviously not only interdisciplinarily between disciplines, for example, philosophy and medicine, that, that's also great, but um, both inter and transdisciplinary. So we are talking about areas like care, therapy, um, psychiatry, where actual work with patients is done. And uh, for, for, for those, I think, uh, phenological psych psychopathology has a bridging function to, to, from philosophy to, to these disciplines and areas. Just to give you a short background, these are the last three English uh, papers uh, over the last three years, so 21, 22, 23. I will talk a lot uh, about the embodied mind emotion. So the latest paper I've um, published with Gerd Kempermann from the DZNE in Dresden. He's a trained neuro neurobiologist, but he's really, he, uh, he is and was interested in philosophy. And we, we um, paired, so to speak, in a, in a podium dis discussion. And we, um, our, our approaches really um, fed, fit well together. You will see that. And I want to give you three initial impressions after closing the window because it's damn cold here in Cologne. Um, just three impressions to, to um, make it easier for you to grasp where I'm coming from and where I'm heading to. So um, maybe you, you, you are aware of the non-study or the non-studies. Um, it's, it's a series of studies uh, in the 90s and 2000s, I think, um, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and the main finding of the non-studies is that there is no strict causality between, uh, on the one hand, neuropathology, and on the other hand, clinical symptoms and the consequences, social consequences, for example, of dementia. So for example, they found nuns with um, a strong and progressed neuropathology but they had, compar had comparatively mild clinical symptoms and they were totally integrated in the social environment. And um, like Kit would, would call it a benign uh, social psychology versus a um, malign social psychology. So they performed pretty well and were doing good in their daily living. And um, this is, I think, a very crucial argument you have to re recall if someone is saying, yeah, why not just look through the biochemical lens? We will uh, be, be successful in 20 years or so. It's because of that. It's because of there is no strict causality between those three um, levels. And so, and the obvious um, conclusion of that is, and that's obvious maybe for you all, but uh, dementia diseases are not only neurodegenerative diseases of the brain, but psycho and social degenerative illnesses of a person in its social environment. That's it's the wording disease versus illness is from Harvey Carell, uh, her phenomenology of, the, of illness. And the disease is, one could define it as an ob objectifiable um, dimension of, a, uh, of, of dementia. 
and um, and the illness is the lived experience how it is to live with those kind of uh, di um, um, dementia um, and other kinds of um, um, yeah diseases both and illnesses because in, in in the case of dementia we have both we have the neurodegeneration and we have the psychosocial uh, dynamics and I think that's really a nice um, uh, exclamation mark because uh, I think it's it's generally speaking still true what Stephen Sabat um, wrote in 2011 until now two very important considerations are virtually ignored in dementia research obviously the inner life of the person diagnosed and the social situation in which the person lives so obviously exactly the the life worldly dimension uh, one could target with the phenomenology psych phenomenological psychopathology and if you look at those three quotations together, they're creating for me some kind of a proper background for my research over the last years. Um, before we, we go into the philosophical details and aspects, it's obviously necessary because it's a psychopathology and not we, we, we don't want to go into the traps a lot of philosophers did go over the last years. We will come back to that. Um, to reflect on dementia diseases, but just re really briefly due to the limited time. Um, it's very important to say that uh, dementia is just an um, umbrella term for different diseases with different causalities, being both disease and illness. I've already explained that, um, but different diseases, for example, Alzheimer's with roughly two thirds of the cases versus frontotemporal, Levy body, and dementia caused by other um, diseases like Parkinson's with different causalities, be, be it genetic, be it uh, environmental, be it lifestyle-based, be it cardiovascular, so you, the list is long. Um, if you want to briefly characterize uh, those diseases, they are age-related, chronic, progressive, irreversible, and incurable until now because incurable, I think it's, it's in the next slide, yeah, I, but I can um, 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 explain it now. Um, there is no causal therapy. You maybe heard in the press of Likanumab and Aducanumab, but they are, and they, they are milestones in terms of pharmacology um, because they, um, they first treated um, like um, they treated both the neuropathology and the symptoms um, experienced, like the, this, this, this causality was, was treated first time, but they are just for a really specific cohort. And it's, it's far from clear that they are of um, huge potential for most of the um, persons affected by dementia in the next decades, especially if you look at the demographic changes in, in the uh, global south, um, because the numbers that there are increasing a lot, and it will be in the end if if it's if these uh, monoclonal antibody therapies will be um, um, provided for a bigger population, it will be a th um, uh, a question of the cost because they are super expensive, and you have to you need the infrastructure to 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 um, yeah to to bring it to the people in the right the right manner. To make it more complicated, um, dementia diseases are um, associated by other psychopathologies such as depression, anxiety disorders, hallucinations in a complex manner. So a depression can be a risk factor and it can be, um, uh, um, it, it can be a cause, a risk factor and the effect of, of a dementia. And so it's, it's, it's a really complex picture. The challenge is, as already stated, we have a demographic change worldwide uh, and uh, a higher need for care facilities and specialists because societies are changing and um, the intergenerational bond like 100 years before is not given anymore. And in conflict with this, that, that stands the wish from most of the, uh, people affected to be cared for at home. So we don't provide the right living environments for people with dementia. We tend to um, um, yeah, bring people, especially in a late stage, to care institutions 
but um, yeah, you, you see that there, there's a conflict. And I think we need to rethink our um, living environments. That's the key. But that's that's another talk. Um, as far as I can see, there is no conv convincing policy strategy to deal with the rising costs and the low quality of life, especially in, in care facilities, maybe except for specialized care facilities, but th these are the minorities. Normally, people with dementia are treated in uh, care facilities for older people, and that's not, not a great development, I would say. This I already explained. And so you see, it's a highly complex psychopathology affecting the whole existence, including the foundations of communication and interaction. That, that was the focus of my research over the last years. But um, yeah, it's, it's not, maybe we can dig into that deeper in the discussion. And just to characterize the dominant research paradigm, uh, it's still deficit oriented. I mean, the words demands uh, here used in ICD-10 and I think still in ICD-11 um, is obviously a negation of men's like demands, it's Latin, it's a negation of, of, of the uh, mind, right? Um, it's still naturalistic. So the DSM, instead of talking about demands, it talks about neurodegeneration. And I think the DSM sees there are cognit cognitive and behavioral changes, but still the core essence is naturalistic in the DSM framework. Um, it's cerebrocentric, so that means it's a syndrome due to the disease of the brain. So it's located in the brain. And per se, that's not bad to say that, but it's wrong if you oversee the body and the environment by doing so, right? That's the, the conclusion is the, the, the problem. Um, and then to, to, to be more sp specific and to be uh, more precise in terms of philosophy and cognitive sciences, um, the, the framework or the dominant research paradigm is cognitivistic. So you will see a reduction in higher cognition, which leaves apart volition and emotion. Uh, even in phenomenology, we will come to, back to that um, later. And it's mnemocentristic. I think it's a term by me. Um, and it means a reduction of memory as, as a guiding symptom. And especially in philosophy, a reduction on declarative memory. And you will see that's the, not the whole equation. Phenologically speaking. And so after uh, introducing that, I think there is an obvious need for a paradigm shift. And one could ask, because I'm a philosopher, <laughs> if philosophy offers this shift. And yeah, maybe you, 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 will, um, yeah, you will think that immediately not so generally stated. But we, we will have a look at that, why philosophy in general does not uh, offer per se um, this shift uh, under the um, notion of nemocentrism. All right. So let us let me start to to make an observation. If you um, maybe Google philosophy and dementia, you can do that afterwards. You will see that most of all contributions, like eighty percent or ninety percent. Um, are revolving around the discourse of the personal identity or identity of self. And then in the second step with memory playing a crucial role. I think that's that's not necessarily bad, but I just want to observe that's the, the, the by far the dominant discourse. And so I want to reflect on this discourse under um, the, the notion of nemocentrism. And so the question is, what is uh, nemocentrism? So first step of nemocentrism in, in my um, reconstruction is that you reduce dementia as a syndrome to a symptom, which is a memory impairment. It's, it's um, taken as a principal feature of Alzheimer's dementia, for example, if you look at the ICD-10. Um, and that's weird for clinicians when I say that. We, I had a, had a lot of uh, discussions uh, on that. I think it's neither true for Alzheimer's dementia in particular, nor for dementias in general. So obviously, um, a memory impairment is a really important symptom. 
of both Alzheimer's and dementia. But from the very beginning, there are several types of, of the symptomatic experience. So for example, the loss of language or the loss of orientation can be more severe very early. Um, for example, if you have a, 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 a phatic type of Alzheimer's dementia, you will have strong issues with the production of language from, from early on. <clears throat> and so for me, it's already here, um, something we should be aware of at least. I'm not saying memory impairment is not given in dementia, but I'm saying we should be aware that there is a, a symptomatical uh, diversity. And the second step is the co cognitivistic reduction of memory. So here, I mean, uh, it's a great handbook from Bernicke and McCadian. And they, they're saying in the very beginning, memory is a fundamental cognitive capacity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, it's a fundamental cognitive capacity, but it's not only a cognitive capacity. If one understands cognition in the sense the cognitive, most of the cognitive sciences uh, are doing. If one sees like cognition always already embedded and enacted and embodied, that's a different story. But this is more the exception of cognition, of an understanding of cognition in philosophy. And here, um, let us have, have a look at the third step, because now the picture gets, gets thicker, so to speak. Um, the, the third step is to link memory, this kind, um, a specific kind of memory to identity and personhood. And that, that's mainly the root of uh, John Locke's famous essay. Um, so the diachronic identity of the person, who I am over the endurance of my lifespan is established, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm subjectively thinking, um, is, is, is established through reflective memory, remembering of past experiences as one's own maybe um, take it as some kind of working definition. So what, what's um, crucial here is like remembering or re recalling is, um, is the bridge over that I need to go to create some kind of diachronic identity of my own. And that's, that's the dominant um, theoretical framework in philosophy until now, I would say, um, even if knowledge changes that. Um, there are several theoretical issues already back then, noted, for example, by John Butler, the need for a pre-reflective self to don't have a to 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 deal with the vicious circle, uh, the transitivity relation. So it's it's not totally apparent to us our past. It's 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 far more fuzzy than uh, so we can recall everything clear and crisp, right? And um, but apart from that maybe more important for us today is that it's the basis of recent cognitivist theories of persistence. So what, what um, Locke developed back then is still very powerful in philosophy today. And that becomes really an obstacle and an issue when it's applied to dementia. You will see that. So there is a famous quotation from Auguste Deta. I have, so to speak, lost myself. So the first patient diagnosed was um, Alzheimer in 1905. And it's true. Reflective modes of memory are strongly affected in the course of dementia. That's totally right. Um, but if we take the first three steps and define dementia over memory, define it as a cognitivist way of memory, and with Locke define it as some kind of internalist understanding of memory, and dementia as a memory killer, it becomes the identity killer. And in the literature, you can read that people with late stage dementia on that theoretical ground is denied personhood because they become quasi persons or post persons. So that's maybe the, the most ethical impactful, most radical position, um, but I wanted to unpack the theoretical steps you need to, to end up with that conclusion. And I would say it's it's dramatically wrong. Maybe it's, it's a good theoretical position, but um, yeah, let's have a look at different kinds of angles on that um, situation. So first of all, and really sketchy. 
um, one could say um, this whole argumentation just looks at one side. It just looks, as you can see now, on the left side. It just looks on the deficits and not on the resources. This is true only for the natural paradigm, obviously. It just looks at the biological aspects and not the psychosocial. Um, it's, it's a reductionist framework, uh, especially the biochemical approach, and you need a more holistic framework to, to deal with these multi-layered disease. Um, it's mainly about explaining and less about understanding, so that's, that's more directed to, to the um, medical uh, framework. Sorry for um, blurring a bit. And um, the zero bro bro centrism needs to be embodied and embedded theoretically speaking. And now here more the philosophical limitations. Um, the mnemocentrism I was uh, um, explaining uh, a minute ago just looks on the left side and doesn't look on the right side. So it's uh, it, it focuses on the reflective dimension and not on the re pre-reflective. It focuses on the verbal and not the nonverbal the actual and not the habitual. It focuses on cognition or internalism and not so much on emotion and volition. And it's like already said, it's an intersubjective approach. At least if one reads only this essay by Locke, uh, one could, could add the political writings, then it's not so clear. Um, but we need to add the intersubjective um, dimension or interpersonal, I would say but that's another discussion. So my point here is that uh, both the naturalistic and um, um, dominant research paradigm in medicine overemphasizes uh, the, the left part and, and the philosophical um, strand too overemphasizes the left part while losing sight of the resources. And um, I will now focus only on the right side. So, and that's that's a bit uh, cheap here, but um, I, I just wanted to state that question, to raise that question, what paradigm meets these criteria or, or what research tradition? And yeah, it's where I'm coming from. Um, it's, it's a bit cheap because I'm obviously um, researching in that tradition, but I, I want to offer you some arguments for, for that um, um, state um, statement. And I tried, um, just as a quick footnote, uh, to be a bit self-critical. So um, the phenological uh, approach is not good per se. It's always depends how you, um, yeah. Yeah, you, you will see it. it. It depends a bit if you are able to see the, the own limitations. And I think maybe that's the purpose of today's talk too, to see my own limitations. And I would like to discuss that with you. So give me, let's, let's give a brief dis, um, description of dementia and phenomenology. It's a very recent phenomenon. Um, I think as far as I know, um, the broader research started approximately 20 years ago with Pia Contor's dissertation in 2004. And I think that it's such a recent phenomenon um, finds it or is symptomatic that in this great handbook of phenological psychopathology, don't get me wrong, this is a great book it, with over a thousand pages, but uh, on dementia are less than three. And it's not under the, the header of dementia. It's only in three paragraphs under memory and attention um, disorders. So it's it's really not really there. <laughs> um, again, in, in phenomenology too, it's very discourse oriented. Here too, it revolves around the identity or the question for the identity of the person and the self. Uh, still, there is a lack, I would say, uh, um, for a comprehensive general psychopathology of dementia diseases. I'm not saying that's easy to achieve. Um, but I would say one needs that as um, a regulative idea, as something we should strive for. This talk is, is trying to, to, to say exactly that. 
And it's resource oriented from the very beginning. All approaches I know, they are all resource oriented, which doesn't mean that they simply ignore the deficits one has uh, if, if one is affected by dementia. Um, but uh, most of the papers trying to develop a counterweight against the dominant naturalistic and deficit oriented paradigm. And for, uh, for doing so, um, most of the approaches trying to capture the structures of lived experience holistically, and most of those papers relate to the notion of embodiment. We will unpack that in a second. So that's my second focus, the phenology of embodiment. And here comes a list. And I did that because you can see there are several notions um, related to the notion of embodiment in phenological dementia research. You can uh, copy paste it and, and uh, find the, the paper you want to read because I think there is a rich diversity and you will see it's, it's the guiding approach in phenology. Very early 2004 um, and following, you have the notion of embodied expressivity and embodied self by Pierre Contos, but used by Christian Tevis, for example. You have the notion of implicit body memory, uh, implicitis Leibgedächtnis uh, of Deutsch by Thomas Fuchs and Michaela Summer. You have the notion of lived embodied subjectivity by Lisa Schell, intercorporal personhood by Kristen Seiler. Embodied Openness by Daniel Petherbridge, Embodied Memories by Lars Christa Hedin. He's not really a phenologist. He's mainly working uh, with a positioning theory, like a social constructivist theory, but his, his aspiration is phenolog phenological. And um, I want to mention that. Um, you have the notion of gestural communicative action. That's my translation because it's a dissertation um, from Beatrice Dörtlinger focusing on gestures in late stage dementia published in German language. Um, you have the notion of therapeutic atmospheres. Maybe you ask yourself, what do atmospheres have in common with bodies and embodiment in a neophenological approach from Schmitz and Böhme and Sonntag is working with that. Um, there is no atmosphere without the body. That. Um, you have the idea of disrupted intercorporeality by my colleague Ragnar Wieniewski, and you have the embodied mind inversion. That's, that's the title of the paper I wrote together with Gab Kempermann, and I want to go into that paper now. And um, as said, we've met at the podium's discussion and starting point was the dilemma of embodied prevention. So we were both invited here as a clinical bio, um, yeah, trained biologist um, and me as a philosopher. Um, you have the dilemma that it now in, in a clinical or medical language, moderate physical activity improves overall health. I think you read that millions of times uh, and it's true for almost every disease. Um, moderate physical activity improves cognitive performance in dementia, mild cognitive impairment and subjective cognitive decline. So that's just the results I'm, I'm paraphrasing, right? And so moderate physical activity is discussed as a super factor in dementia prevention, contributing to an overarching beneficial lifestyle. So that's the ex uh, expectance or that's the wish at least behind that. And the empirical um, findings are quite convincing. Um, but obviously there's um, the issue that mechanistic health programs and checklists remain lifeless and receive too little compliance. You can think about that. Um, if it's about prevention, so you don't want to get ill, right? And if it's just health and not well-being, yeah, why prevent something which maybe occurs in 50 years and, <laughs> and um, which is only defined by health, so having a, a healthy body? And that's already the dile dilemma because it was overemphasized on the health facet um, and the 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 um, ignorance of the well-being and something like um, joy and meaningfulness and so on. It's obvious that people don't implement these checklists into their lives because checklists are not sexy uh, for doing so. 
And so a potential solution is to, to change the framework for doing so. Um, our paper tried to bring philosophical and empirical insights into dialogue in a holistic framework uh, and to aid prevention and therapy. And we called it the embodied mind in motion model. Gerd's perspective was the one on prevention and my perspective was on therapy and in brackets on in, uh, care because embodiment, that's, uh, that's our common uh, denominator, um, is mainly regarded as a resource in phenomenology for therapy and care, not for prevention. And um, one interesting development in empirical studies and big empirical studies was that there are interesting results that holistic activities, so now really leaving this paradigm of mechanistic health uh, checklists uh, aside, that holistic activities like hiking, yoga, music, and dance illustrate that activity needs to be embodied in everyday life, which is a bit trivial, I think, and a way that is meaningful to the individual. And that's exactly the, the point where I um, yeah, catch, caught the ball, because um, in phenomenology, we have this notion of embodied habits. And I will go into the embodied habits, but they are crucial. Embodied habits are individual meaningful movement practices. We can cultivate them, we can leave them aside, but you will see in a second, they are a really, really rich resource of and of high importance for both prevention, therapy and care when it comes to dementia. And you see in brackets, the center potential, you will learn what I mean with that in a second. So embodied habits in dementia, to, to um, reflect a bit on that. This are already stated. Um, so they are a crucial resource due to the deterioration of reflective, declarative and symbolical abilities. You re recall that list, that scheme I've, I've shown you. So the left, left side is, is decreasing and impaired, but embodied, um, habits offering exactly the right side. They are pre-reflective. They are uh, some kind of um, huge resource with high potential. And Fuchs defined them as a kind of memory which remains preserved right up to the sta last stages of the illness. So he, he talks about dementia and in which the biographical history of the patient is manifested. And if you like, one could really define it very condensed as embodied long-term memory. So with that, I mean, to, to give you just one quick example, driving bike. Do you, uh, I mean, it's, it's something, it's, you don't think about that, right? Really a classical example for procedural memory. You don't think about that, but you will see it's not only it can, if, if we reduce it to just the procedural component we are missing uh, the good stuff, so to speak. And um, I want to show you that embodied habits in an example in a minute are a resource of intra and interpersonal constitution like myself and through others of identity with vertical depth. With that, I mean, they are relevant for my biography and horizontal uh, it should say breath. So they are relevant for my daily tasks, brushing teeth, going to work, et cetera, et cetera. They can be more thoroughly defined as some kind of sedimented history of our practices within our social cultural environment, guiding the way we feel, think and act. So they remain tested. They are some kind of taken for granted thing in our life worldly existence. For example, again, the, the, the bike example is good. When we, when we go uh, by a bike, we don't think about it, reflect about that. But if we have an impairment, we broke our leg or so, these structures become uh, apparent, explicit, right? And um, over the last decades, several scholars um, highlighted different dimensions of embodied habits. And we will apply those dimensions to an example I, I will give you. So um, already mentioned the procedural dimension, the situational, I'm, I'm just reading that list and we will apply that. 
um, the intercorporeal, the expressive, the affective, and the narrative. I um, emphasize the latter because um, that's um, maybe one contribution from the paper I wrote with Gerd to, um, to show that these embodied habits are crucial for our, our affective identity and they have the potential of creating the narrative self, which is mainly uh, conceptualized by verbal language. And I think for the philosophical discourse, that's a really interesting point. The example we used in the paper was Marta Sinta Gonzalez Saldana. She was a ballerina. Um, maybe you know that video. Um, she was a professional ballerina. She ran a ballet school in Madrid and she uh, um, embodied a lifelong ambition to bring ballet to the people. Um, there is a video on YouTube. It's world famous. It, 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 it gone viral after her death. Um, but you have to be aware it was a bit embellished by the NGO, Musica para Desperta. Um, so wrong pictures, a few not correct information given to just make it even more interesting for a bigger audience. And as already said, it became posthumous famous via YouTube. And it shows Marta probably in the mid stage of Alzheimer's dementia, but these clinical um, details and facts are not really transparent. Um, and the video is super um, impressive. And I think um, maybe it, there will be issues showing that video. Um, I would like to try. And maybe I, I just look in your faces and see if you can hear the sound. Okay, let's try. No sound? Okay. I, I will leave it like for a few seconds. And you have to watch it after this talk. All right. So it's a music with the dancing choreography in a wheelchair. And you have to, as said, you have to watch it if you don't know it uh, after this talk, because uh, you can see a lot in that um, video and you can ask what takes place in terms of embodied habits. So um, what you see is that a particular piece of music, it's Tchaikovsky's Swan Leg. This piece of music offers the proper cue or the proper situation for the activation of procedural body memory. So the dance performance she learned over her career becomes activated. Uh, from the perspective of intercorporeality, you, you saw that in just these few seconds. First, she's not really into, the, doesn't come into that piece. And then the carer um, um, kisses her hand and encourages her and, and speaks uh, uh, silent to her. And then she starts performing. And this is why I left the video on despite it didn't have uh, audio. Um, and it's, I think in this intercorporeal sense, she is aware that there is an audience. She is performing in front of people. She's performing in front of the video. And I would say it's crucial for a performance, be it ballet or other performance, that there is some kind of sense of intercorporeality, be it as a, a, a physical audience or a virtual one. Um, in terms of affectivity, you could say that her performance, you will totally grasp that when you watch the video by your own. Her performance co conveys high emotional significance by the rich expressive ca character of her body. So you see that her whole body language is totally in sync with the music and she's perfect in, in setting the accents of the piece. It's, it's really impressive. <clears throat> and in terms of narrative embodied habits, uh, you could say on the one hand, her whole appearance is very neat and elegant. So she really is embodying the style of a ballerina and by, by the reports of her friends and the care staff, 
um, it's it's really um, um, convincing that most of the time she was dressed uh, in this kind of elegant manner. And one could say that, especially in that piece, she's able to narrate who she is by the means of nonverbal embodied habits. And less that uh, then already said by episodic and semantic memory, which is in the classical theories, the main source of uh, autobiographical memory. So a totally alternative to the, to the philosophical stream, which is dominating. And so what one could alter the um, exclamation of Auguste Data in, 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 inside of this material to say, I have, so to speak, preserved myself in terms of embodied cognition, right? So there are simply two ways of being, or I, I mean, it's, it's not necessary to, to choose one, two, three or so, but there are two sides of our existence. And one is more co cognitivist uh, language-based and the other one is more embodied and performative based and so on. And um, obviously the lesson is not um, to become uh, a ballerina, but the lesson is to, to reflect on your own existence to see what's your center potential, right? For, for me, I'm, I'm, for example, I'm doing martial arts for 20 years and they, 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 are, um, they have a really, really rich um, range. They, they have hard fighting, but they have breathing techniques and so on. And in all kinds of situations of my existence, I'm able to, to use parts of that um, history. I'm, I'm, I'm accumulated over my experience. And I think everyone should look for these kind of embodied practices, which are not only healthy, but improve your well-being, which make you happy, maybe to, to say it simply. So and that's more some kind of um, personal uh, um, summary and outlook. Um, but first, coming back to our talk, now I'm, I'm, I'm finishing the talk. Um, as we have seen, the majority of both philosophical and phenomenological contributions to dementia revolve around the discourse on personal identity. The discourse, this discourse is both, uh, in Husserl's words, revealing and concealing. So um, on the one hand, fundamental shortcomings of the dominant paradigm are recognized, addressed and transformed, but it can turn into mnemocentrism. And actually you want just to prove theoretical positions and you're really not interested in having a proper look at dementia versus embodiment. So you, you're really looking for um, resources of the people to, to improve care and therapy or living in general. We don't necessarily have to use this institutional language, right? Um, but also in phenomenology, maybe because it's so young, uh, in terms of applying it to dementia, you, we have a reduction of the symptomatic spectrum um, and the main line is uh, the connection between memory, embodiment, and identity. And one could call it um, embodyism, right? So I think it's, it's a rich approach and it's really helpful in, um, in complementing dementia research so far. But I think we have to critically self-evaluate what we are doing. And um, so for me, it was in the last years a lot about... Um, um, having a more structural approach, um, bringing um, symptoms together and reflect on what they do have in common and taking into account, I mean, that's, that's also done by the embodiment paradigm, the existential effective and pathological dimensions. So for example, one notion, maybe you, you already read it in the paper of 21 and 22 is existential homelessness. And it's some kind of Mm, it sounds almost poetic, but it's it's um, it's the finding that people with progressed dementia sometimes lose the feeling of being home, and so they they are wandering around and they're, they're looking for the place they feel sheltered. But maybe even they are at home at their physical home, they can they they've lost the ability to feel home, and that's I think a necessary step to add the effective layers 
of what uh, dementia does to to my experience of the world um th this has to 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 broaden even and um so that's more some kind of a political statement um but maybe you you convince yourself um i would say this the life world approach i'm using in my work provides a foundation that serves as an inter and transdisciplinary counterweight and bridge. So we have an improved understanding of symptoms, which are not only useful for diagnosis, but also for therapy and care. Um, so by that, I mean, we can deepen and broaden insights concerning the use of art, design, technology, architecture, and body language. And these are all topics I touched over the last years. And I think there is a lot of potential when you when it comes to see developments, for, a, for example, in architecture, um, to, to bring philosophy and architecture into dialogue. But it's, it's not already done, right? Um, and this kind of strong notion of embodiment in a philological or an active sense helps to uh, overcome dualisms. For example, like the, the dominant psychophysicalism in uh, modern science. Um, we could go into that in a discussion. Last slide. I think the pol position I'm standing for offers some kind of middle way between Scylla and Charyb uh, Charybdis. At least that's my self-perception. Um, so on the one side, it stays in touch with the psychiatric reality. Um, without petrifying into classification systems. That's really important, obviously. And on the other hand, it stays in touch with the social cultural diversity without exhausting itself in discourse theory and ethics. Um, but nevertheless, and that's maybe the weakest spot of my whole approach, um, that movements such as critical phenology and new dementia they are really crucial in uh, reflecting the political, social, cultural, economic, and institutional conditions and injustices. They are, I think, closer to these um, social political developments than my theory could ever be. But that's, I think that's something good to, to recognize. And yeah, with that, I thank you for your intention and I'm really looking forward for the discussion. Thank you.